morning. Good morning and welcome. This is Mr. B's Sunday School. I am Mr. B, and today we are here to consider the rapture and the day of the Lord. Many people refer to, as the scriptures we're about to read, as the future of the church or the end of times or simply as last things. However, as we will see, the Apostle Paul, Jesus, the Apostle Peter, and the prophets use simple, easy to understand phrases like hope or no hope, light or darkness. The Apostle Paul also uses pronouns in the passage, the primary passage we're looking at today, to help us understand who is experiencing what. For example, he begins by speaking about what will happen to we and you, and later turns to speaking about what will happen to them and they. We'll see how all that works out in just a minute. But the first thing we like to do in this class is pray. Thank you for your holy word. Father in heaven, pray that you bless the reading of your word today. Help us to trust in you and to rely on you in all we think and say and do. Thank you for your word now. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, we remember from our study of the book of Acts that Paul and Silas traveled through the towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia, and they came to Thessalonica, and that for three Sabbaths, three weeks, he explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. The Bible tells us that some of the Jews who listened were persuaded, along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. Unfortunately, some of the Jews were jealous, so they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and start a riot. And that was the end of Paul's time with the Thessalonians. So you might ask, what could the Thessalonians have learned from the Apostle Paul in just three weeks. Apparently, quite a lot, because Paul had a habit of teaching and preaching for many hours at a time, whenever he had an opportunity. Paul's, now, Paul's young assistant, Timothy, had occasion to visit the Thessalonian church later. Timothy brought a glowing report of the believer's spiritual growth. However, the Thessalonians also had some questions and concerns, and we will be taking a look at part of the Apostle Paul's response today. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're starting at verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. 
For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Okay. A pronoun is a word used, used in everyday language to refer to ourselves and others. Personal pronouns used in this passage include you and we. Please notice that we read through our passage today. Oh, please notice that as we read, there we go, as we read through our passage today, the pronouns will shift from we and you to them and they. The faithful believers at Thessalonica were concerned that their fellow believers who died already might miss out on the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus. As Paul says, death is reduced to sleep if you are a believer. Let's say you are convicted of certain crimes and you received the death penalty. Such is the condition of each of us, since the Bible, the truth of God, clearly teaches that all have sinned. And we know that the penalty for sin is death. However, if we confess our sins, that is to say, that is to say we confess our sin guilt before God and choose to make Jesus our Lord and Savior, then the certainty of our death sentence is reduced to, for our bodies at least, to the requirement of taking a nap, possibly. Some people call it a dirt nap. Got a reading for you from the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 14. We're starting at verse 1. So red letter edition. This is Jesus speaking, so this is all in red letters here. It says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go, and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Got a little note here. It says, as the way, Jesus is our path to the Father. As the truth he is the reality of all God's promises. As the life, 
he joins his divine life to ours, both now and eternally. Okay. Now, the resurrection, you can call it a metamorphosis, or our bodies are suddenly turned from tired, sickly, and perishable to forever strong, forever well, and imperishable. And that's based on Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. The physical body that Jesus had after his resurrection was not the same as the one he had before his resurrection. And our body will not be the same either. Okay, let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians 4. We're picking it up at verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Now, a man we, know, we now refer to as St. Jerome was responsible for translating the New Testament from Greek, the original language in which it was written, to Latin, which was the common language at the time, he and his associates worked to translate both the New Testament and the Old Testament. This all happened between 383 and 404 AD. AD, or Anno Domini, which is Latin for in the year of our Lord, is a way of counting years based on the estimated date of the birth of Jesus Christ. Now in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17, we find the original Greek word harpazo, which means to be caught up. And we know when St. Jerome and his associates translated the original Greek to the common language, they translated the word Greek word harpazo to the Latin word repemur. I don't speak Latin either. Hmm. The French changed repemur to raptura, and that is where we get our English word rapture. So if you don't like the English word rapture, we can use the Latin word repemur. And if you don't like the Latin word repemur, we can use the Greek word harpazo. And if you're not sure what harpazo originally meant when the Apostle Paul wrote it, or what the Apostle Paul was thinking about when he used the word in 1 Thessalonians, it's not that hard to find other uses of that exact word in the New Testament and a very similar word in Hebrew in the Old Testament. To keep it simple, let's just look at the New Testament. Dr. Luke in Acts 8, 39 uses the word harpazo, 
when he is speaking of Philip the evangelist the, and the Ethiopian eunuch. Luke informs us that after Philip baptized the Ethiopian, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. The word used here is harpazo. Another familiar use of the word harpazo, this time as used by Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, where Paul describes his vision of heaven. He says that he was caught up to paradise. Again, the word here is harpazo. The Apostle Paul is not trying to confuse his audience or complicate the issue. We have plenty of theologians nowadays to help us out with that. Paul was simply providing us with facts, things that he understood to be biblically true. However, Paul does provide us with some clues, as I mentioned earlier. Let's watch the change in the type of pronouns Paul uses as we read this next passage. Please notice how Paul changes from talking about what will happen to we and you to what will happen to them and they. We're at 1st of Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 1. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Okay. Now, we remember from the book of Genesis, chapter 18, how Abraham remained standing before the Lord when the three visitors came to talk to Abraham and tell Abraham about the judgment of God on the wicked. What was Abraham's response? Abraham said, <clears throat> Will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? God rescued Lot and Lot's daughters before bringing destruction on the wicked. Just as God rescued Noah and Noah's family, before destroying the wicked. The God of the Bible is not a God who has changed in any way, nor will he ever change. Got a reading for you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're at verse 4. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. Okay. Got a reading for you from the prophet Jeremiah. This is at Jeremiah chapter 6. We're starting at verse 16. Thus says the Lord, Stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. 
I set watchmen over you, saying, Pay attention to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not pay attention. Therefore, hear, O nations, and know, O congregation, what will happen to them. Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster upon this people, the fruit of their devices, because they have not paid attention to my words. And as for my law, they have rejected it. Okay. God has given us his word, the Bible, to warn us of dangers. In ancient times, watchmen would blow trumpets to warn the people of approaching danger. There is a fruit, a reward, a consequence for all evil in the earth. And that consequence is unavoidable. God has faithfully warned the people of the earth and has given us his eternal word. However, many people choose to reject God's word or to ignore it. The Bible is very clear on what will happen to them. Got a reading from 1 Thessalonians. We're at chapter 5, verse 8. <clears throat> but since we belong to the day, let us be self controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. Got a little note here that says, As you near the end of a long race, your legs ache, your throat burns, and your whole body cries out for you to stop. This is when your friends and fans are most valuable. Their encouragement helps you push through the pain to, to the finish line. In the same way, Christians are to encourage one another. A word of encouragement offered at the right moment can be the difference between finishing well and collapsing along the way. Look around you. Be sensitive to others' need for encouragement and offer supportive words or actions. Okay. Got a reading for you from the book of Isaiah. Let's take a look. We're at Isaiah chapter 13, and we're starting at verse 9. For see, the day of the Lord is coming, the terrible day of his fury and fierce anger. The land will be made desolate, and all the sinners destroyed with it. The heavens will be black above them, the stars will give no light. 
The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will provide no light. I, the Lord, will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their sin. I will crush the arrogance of the proud and humble the pride of the mighty. I will make people scarcer than gold, more rare than the fine gold of Ophir. For I will shake the heavens and the earth will move from its place when the Lord of heaven's armies displays his wrath in the day of his fierce anger. Okay. So, what should we conclude? What can we conclude? Certainly, there is a day of judgment coming on the wicked, and there is also a commitment made by God that his son will command and suddenly remove all the saints, both the dead and the living from the earth. Let's take a look at what the Apostle Paul says to the church at Corinth. We're at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 51. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Okay. I have not found any sequence of events or specific timing in the scripture, although there are, there certainly is a requirement in God's word regarding our being aware of the times, that is to say, the evil around us, and the seasons, or the events of our age. Going to have the Apostle Peter summarize our study today, and we're at... <clears throat> Second Peter, chapter 3, and we're going to start at verse 9. The Lord does not delay as though he were unable to act, and is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is extraordinarily patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, 
And then the heavens will vanish with a mighty and thunderous roar. And the material elements will be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and the works that are on it will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be in the meantime? In holy behavior, that is, in a pattern of daily life that sets you apart as a believer, and in godliness, displaying profound reverence toward our awesome God. While you earnestly look for and await the coming of the day of God. For on this day the heavens will be destroyed by burning. And the immaterial elements will melt with intense heat. But in accordance with his promise, we expectantly await new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So, beloved, since you are looking forward to these things, be diligent and make every effort to be found by him at his return, spotless and blameless, in peace, that is, inwardly calm, with a sense of spiritual well-being and confidence, having lived a life of obedience to him. A little note here, it says, The primary purpose of prophetic teaching is not to satisfy our curiosity, but to motivate us to change our lives. Rather than work for things that will ultimately be destroyed, we should work for things that are eternal. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your holy word. Thank you that we can know for sure what will happen in the future. Pray that you bless the reading of your holy word for each of us this week. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Have a great week.